Good evening. My name is Sofia Lemos. I'm the Associate Curator of Public Programs at the Riga International Biennial of Contemporary Art, and suddenly it all blossoms. It is my pleasure welcoming you to our online series of talks and conversations, this week devoted to the glossary word dreams. When millions of persons have lost their jobs, their source of livelihood during the pandemic, how might we imagine a grammar of survival? When the virus is still raging through many cities and parts of the world, can we foresee collective modes of respite, of communication, of disruption? How can dream states inform our making of political realities in the aftermath of the pandemic? I'm pleased to introduce Jackie Wang, who works at the intersection between experimental out of fiction, poetry and political economy, mapping the unresolved ethical and poetics of life with the intertwined histories of capitalism and the nation state. Jackie, it is my pleasure welcoming you today. Thank you for connecting with us. So this is Oceanic Feeling and Communist Affect. Between 1923 and 1936, the French mystic Roman Roland exchanged 20 letters with Sigmund Freud, inspired by his exchanges with Roland. Freud elaborated the concept of oceanic feeling in his 1930 work, Civilization and Its Discontents. In this work, Freud describes oceanic feeling as a feeling of limitlessness that marks a return to the infantile, pre edible mode of being, where the infant cannot distinguish itself from its mother. Roland, however, describes oceanic feeling as a mystical feeling that enables one to commune with the universe. For Roland, the oceanic was the affective state underlying all religious experience. This presentation examines the concept of oceanic feeling in a psychoanalytic and philosophical discourse. There are two distinct notions of the oceanic operating in the work of Freud, Roland, and Kristeva. On the one hand, we have a notion of the oceanic as defensive, infantile, and dissociative. On the other, we have a notion of the oceanic as joyful, connective, and integrative. I will take up the latter form for the purpose of elaborating a project of communist affect. Given that the oceanic has the potential to unsettle subjectivity, I argue that the oceanic can be a point of departure for new socialities and potential modes that do not rely on discrete selves. Though some psychoanalytic thinkers have disavowed the oceanic, at its best, oceanic feeling can sensitize us to the way that, as Nerval writes, everything lives, moves, everything corresponds. One, on regression, Freud and Kristeva. In 1930, Freud first popularized the term oceanic feeling in civilization and its discontents, a work that is focused on the role of religion in the life of the common man, rather than the source of religious feeling for mystics and saints. For Freud, great men of religious feeling are rare, but he acknowledges one such great man, great man, the religious scholar Romain Roland. Roland had written to Freud after reading The Future of an Illusion, expressing that he was sympathetic to Freud's critique of religion, but noted that he overlooked that all religion is, in some sense, rooted in mystical experience or oceanic feeling. In Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud dismisses oceanic feeling as a potential topic of psychoanalytic investigation by claiming that it is difficult to undertake a scientific study of feeling. While Freud writes that he cannot discover the oceanic feeling in himself, he does not deny that the oceanic occurs in other people. In psychoanalytic terms, Freud understands this feeling 
as an ego disturbance that unsettles the boundaries of the self. When the ego is functioning properly, it produces a solid sense of the self as autonomous and unitary. However, on Freud's account, oceanic feeling harkens back to the time when the infant at the breast was not able to distinguish itself from its mother or the outside world. During this stage, the ego included everything. Julia Kristeva's conceptualization of oceanic feeling is similar to Freud in that the oceanic state is considered an infantile regression. In Black Sun, she describes the oceanic as depressive denial, a form of symbolic suicide and a quote, fantasy of untouchable fullness that leads the subject to commit suicide without anguish of disintegration as a reuniting with archaic non-integration as lethal as it is jubilatory, end quote. However, while Freud did not characterize oceanic feeling as either feminine or masculine, Kristeva's description of the oceanic suggests that it emerges from a feminine psychic structure. Throughout the book, Kristeva associates feminine melancholia with the lethal ocean. Though Kristeva acknowledges the ecstatic aspects of oceanic feeling, on what she would call jouissance in Lacanian terms, she ultimately dismisses it as a form of wounded narcissism, which allows women to gain a kind of protective om omnipotence by, quote, limitlessly spreading her constrained sorrow to achieve a hallucinated completeness, end quote. In a sense, Kristeva's oceanic is a kind of premature death that is paradoxically a preemptive defense against death. In the incredible need to believe, Kristeva treats oceanic feeling with more nuance. She attempts to take seriously the pre-religious need to believe and thus distances herself from Freud's position on religion, mysticism, and oceanic feeling. Kristeva makes the bold assertion that belief is the cornerstone of the subject's capacity to speak. Though oceanic feeling without the life raft of the loving father signifier would obliterate the subject, the oceanic can ground the subject by affirming the possibility of knowing. While Kristeva treats the oceanic as lethal in Black Sun, in her later work, the oceanic is an expression of the pre-religious need to believe. Perhaps Kristeva did not so much change her position on the oceanic as she did merely emphasize the need for the paternal function and language to regulate the destructivity of the maternal oceanic and to give meaning to what would otherwise be an unspeakable trauma. The capacity to name the experience ensures that the oceanic does not become a catastrophic dissolution of the self. What Kristeva is proposing is not so much a disavowal of the oceanic on the grounds that it is infantile, as Freud does, but a new orientation to the oceanic, one that insists that the oceanic can be a gift or a source of artistic inspiration, so long as it is mediated and managed by the psychoanalytic practice of signification. Perhaps, Rather than trying to purge, disavow, avoid, or control the tra traumatic excitation of oceanic feeling, it makes more sense to dwell in it, to silence the repulsive dread of maternal suffocation, to inhabit the feeling, getting filled up and blissed out, knowing full well 
that on the other side of the experience lies an opportunity to assimilate the gift by processing and naming it. Perhaps it would be possible to alternate between these divergent affective spaces and to use them to enrich each other. Two, on cosmic connectedness, Roland and Spinoza. Roland noted in his, le in his letters to Freud that he derived the concept of oceanic feeling from the 17th century Dutch philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza proposed that existence belongs to the nature of substance and that all existence consists of a single infinite substance he refers to as God or nature. An experience of ego loss that enables one to commune with the substance of existence in a way that radically alters one's orientation to the world. After Roland lost his religion, Catholicism, he began to adopt a syncretic blend of Spinozism and Eastern religious traditions. The influence of Spinoza on Roland's development of the concept of the oceanic cannot be understated because Spinoza not only provided a philosophical framework through which to understand oceanic feeling, but also because the oceanic was inspired by a mystical experience Roland had while reading Spinoza's ethics. Roland Spinoza's conception of oceanic feeling differs from the psychoanalytic conception most markedly in its characterization of the affective state undergirding the experience. While Kristeva relates oceanic feeling to melancholia, Roland relates oceanic feeling to joy. This is a significant distinction because for Spinoza, the sad passions decrease a body's capacity to act, whereas joy enhances it. Thus, we might make a distinction between Kristeva's morbid oceanic and Roland's vitalist oceanic, which produces a vital upsurge in the person experiencing it. I argue that a vitalist conception of the oceanic rooted in the thinking of Spinoza is more socially and politically enabling than certain antisocial psychoanalytic conceptions of the oceanic. In recent years, post-Marxists influenced by Deleuze's thought have also used Spinoza to theorize the nature of collective struggle and the politics of affect. It is not surprising that post-Marxists who feel that communism is at an impasse have turned to Spinoza both for his affective philosophy and his radically ecological thought. For Spinoza, if God is infinity, then everything that exists exists in God. Therefore, all things are part of the single substance that is called nature or God. Thus, Spinoza's philosophy, which is sometimes called a rational mysticism, reveals a kind of already existing communism, even while on another level we inhabit a historical milieu that is considered post-communist insofar as the major communist political endeavors of the 20th century have failed. But if we concede that communism failed, perhaps it is not due to a failure to figure out an ideal economic mode of organization, but because we didn't have the affective and imaginative resources to even begin to envision a mode of existence centered on connectedness over differentiation. Three, on the social implications of oceanic feeling. Roland rejects the view of the oceanic as a regressive defensive withdrawal from the world and instead asserts that the oceanic can enhance 
one's being towards the world by disappearing the boundaries of the ego. Whether our individuation is psychic, discursive, linguistic, or ideological in origin, affective states that take us beyond the boundaries of the self and grant us contact with the infinite have the potential to open up new modes of relationality. On this view, the oceanic could be considered a revelation, the illumination of an already existing communalism and the direct experience of our embeddedness in the world. To dismiss oceanic feeling on the grounds that it is infantile tacitly locates adult subjectivity in the capacity to differentiate self from other rather than the capacity to conceptualize of the subject as connected as part of an assemblage or node inscribed within a larger world or network. Framed this way, it becomes possible to see that the denigration of oceanic feeling by some psychoanalytic thinkers also reveals an attachment to a specific idea of the subject. In a sense, oceanic feeling as an affective state has the potential to open up the subject by temporarily dissolving its boundaries. While this has implications for how we define and understand subjectivity, it also has social and political implications. What would it mean to socialize or communize oceanic feeling? Can the oceanic act as a feeling in common that serves as the experiential basis for the co-construction of new worlds? In recent years, a group of anonymous friendship theorists drawing on the work of Deleuze Guattari, Tacoon, and Spinoza have used the concept of constellations as a way to visualize their social mode. Quote, we form constellations. Our bodies are never isolated, are always enmeshed in shifting patterns of relations. Scattered across space, ourselves form patterns trace connections ethical but unseen. They give us consistency and a form outside of our solitude. When we make our connections material, our constellations take shape, become tactile, make worlds, end quote. This use of constellations to imagine social relations emphasizes the need for both social imagination and material acts that make the constellation tangible. For instance, a constellation may be made palpable when a group of friends live together, care for each other, think together, and create new forms of life. Affinity thus becomes not just a matter of shared personal or political beliefs, but the entwinement of our everyday lives. As the constellation becomes more material, it becomes more difficult to imagine that the self can ever be understood in isolation. Furthermore, the creation of constellations enchants our social world by giving intention and meaning to our web of relations. The image of the constellation struck me because I had recently read Kristeva quoting Naval describe the oceanic as the illumination of the transparent network that covers the world. What is a constellation if not the illumination of possible lines of connection between scattered celestial bodies such that they form a larger body? Could the oceanic be a way to map out new constellations when forms become ossified? Perhaps when the differentiating mind is silenced, during those moments one experiences the oceanic, 
it becomes possible to imagine oneself as embedded in a constellation. Four, on collectivity and the unbounded self, Moten Seaborn sociality. Fred Moten's theorization of blackness bears striking resemblance to both Freud and Roland's take on oceanic healing. For Moten, blackness is a paraontological mode of being that is literally connected to and produced by the ocean. In Freud and Moten's discourse, black being and oceanic feeling are both connected with the maternal, though unlike Kristeva, Moten does not frame the maternal as threatening, nor does he describe the maternal as engulfing and in need of the intervention of the paternal function. For both Roland and Moten, the sea is that which unsettles being, though in Moten's writing, the sea is linked to the legacies of slavery, and in particular, the dispersal of people of African descent around the world on slave ships. The sea is also figured as a passage that marks an ontological rupture. Furthermore, blackness is also oceanic insofar it is, as it is not fixed to a particular land base. It unsettles the notion of home and is marked by dislocation. Moten also argues that blackness is an ejection from the symbolics of le legitimate personhood, as it is an uncoded zone of being that exists outside the arena of social recognition. While Moten does not downplay the brutality of this imposed banishment from subjectivity, he does see it as the condition of possibility for the creation of insurgent black social life or what he sometimes calls undercommon sociality. When Moten writes about, quote, the wailing that accompanies entrance into an expulsion from sociality, end quote, he does so in a lyrical register that captures both the terrible and ecstatic dimensions of this violent expulsion entrance. This expulsion from human sociality and entrance into black sociality is also constituted by the violence of the middle passage. He writes, quote, it is terrible to have come from nothing but the sea, which is nowhere navigable navigable only in its constant auto dislocation. The absence of solidity seems to demand some other ceremony of hailing that will have been carried out on some more exalted frequency." End quote. Throughout Moton's work, the sea as well as the experience of being shipped is used to theorize the fluidity of blackness. To be a citizen of the sea is also to be stateless. Moten writes, quote, we study our seaborne variants sent by its prehistory into arrivance without arrival as a poetics of lore, of abnormal articulation, where the relation between joint and flesh is the pleaded distance of a musical moment that is emphatically, palpably imperceptible and therefore exhausts description." End quote. The experience of existing in the break, of being blown, shipped, marooned, dislocated, produces an abnormal articulation because it is an experience that exhausts description. Given that these subterranean modes of being are outside the realm of social recognition, black social life registers as nothing to those who do not understand it. The uncontainability of blackness, like oceanic feeling, 
deconstructs notion of the subject as bounded. Concluding thoughts. Following Roland, I argue that the oceanic can be a source of creative and social inspiration. Given that this presentation has dealt primarily with theoretical debates, several practical questions remain. Would it be possible to induce an oceanic experience? If not, why should we concern ourselves with an affective state that is only available to a few lucky or unlucky initiates? In response to these questions, I would argue that oceanic feeling is largely involuntary, though it might be possible to induce or cultivate oceanic experience experiences through meditation, rhythmic breathing, psychedelic drugs, participating in a riot, fasting, sleep deprivation, tantric sex, BDSM, chanting, emotional pain and grief, physical pain, exercise, prayer, music, experiences of collective euphoria, and any number of activities that push one to a threshold state of consciousness. Furthermore, my research on oceanic feelings suggests that it may be linked to trauma. In trauma studies, many scholars have noted that people who have experienced trauma do not experience themselves as selves at all. As Judith Herman notes, quote, Survivors rut routinely describe themselves as outside the compact of ordinary human relations, as supernatural creatures or non-human life forms. They think of themselves as witches, vampires, dogs, rats, or snakes. Some use the imagery of excrement or filth to describe their inner sense of self." End quote. The linking of trauma to oceanic feeling might support the idea that oceanic feeling is a kind of manic defense against pain. In the end, the oceanic may at once be an experience rooted in pain and a source of ecstatic joy, a kind of terrible gift. Thank you. Thank you, dear Jackie. Um, these are indeed trialing times um, and the possibility of imagining the relational extent that connects all beings gains um, gravity during this period when most of the world has forcibly had to disassociate from the idea of the self as autonomous and immunitary. So as a way of starting our conversation, uh, how might your vitalistic conception of the oceanic and subtle current views of social distancing, of sheltering in place um, during the pandemic, and in relation as well to the continuum of political violence that separates beings as discrete entities in social life? This is a great question and something that I have been thinking about um, as I think about the um, pandemic and you see these infographics that show the spread of coronavirus across the world. In many ways, tracking the connection bet between people through the spread of coronavirus creates a kind of constellation. It shows the way in which literally every person on the planet is connected to someone else. Um, and as things started shutting down and we were you know, everyone's forced into quarantine, it had this kind of atomizing effect on people. And of course, I support these measures to stop the spread of coronavirus. But in some ways, the um, quarantine was a way of, you know, forcing people to separate in a physical sense from other people to stop the spread. And I was thinking about this in relation to so the practice of solitary confinement in prisons. Um, all of the, you know, 
memes that were circulating on the internet about people you know, kind of losing their minds in quarantine and the um, articles about, you know, what astronauts experience when they're in outer space and cut off from human relations and trying to, you know, take the advice of astronauts to figure out how to cope with this situation. I think it, um, for me at least, m made me aware of my dependence on physical connection to people and being socially embedded in a physical sense in order to just kind of, you know, maintain um, my sanity and grounding in reality. So when I think about um, solitary, solitary confinement, I think about the imposed violence of isolation. And it was, um, you know, watching the protest movement in the United States unfold in the wake of the quarantine, um, I could also feel that um, hunger for social connection when, when people started taking to the streets. It was like there was a buildup of the need to be with other people. Um, and so when I think about what is potentially enabling about oceanic feelings, in some ways, it's not even about um, creating a new conception of the collective, but becoming to attuned to the way in which we are already connected to other people through our dependencies and to kind of um, disabuse ourselves of this enlightenment conception of the subject as autonomous and self-standing and sovereign and not you know relying on the care and labor of other people in your work you also delve into um how forms of confinement have the ability to structure our mental lives the temporalities of dreaming and the capacity for imagination um, and you argue that these precisely are those dimensions that cannot be contained in the gram of possibility. Um, I understand that part of this new essay is delving into the space of creativity and that the British psychoanalyst Marion Milner was also an inspiration, as, as was Virginia Woolf, um, for their bridging between oceanic feeling and dream states. So how do these states animate writers and artists? Could you expand on this? For a while, I was very interested in psychoanalytic debates about creativity. You know, um, some analysts might, psychoanalytic thinkers might say that um, creativity is uh, neurotic in some way. But Marion Milner has a very interesting um, analysis of creativity that is tied to oceanic feeling and the way in which um, oscillation between different psychic modes enable creativity. So the way that she describes it is you need to dive and then you need to come to the surface and it's part of a dialectical process where you, you move between an oceanic state where your consciousness is kind of wide and you take everything in and then you move to a state where you try to give shape um, to what you are able to access to, what you are able to access through the oceanic feeling. And this is something that I've been um, thinking about a lot in relation to the work of Virginia Woolf. So I read a biography of Virginia Woolf recently um, and in it, I read that she um, would spend her summers as a child near, um, she would vacation with her family in St. Ives, a British seaside town. And when she was a child, her window 
was next to the ocean and she would listen to just the waves, the waves coming in and then receding. And she wrote that that was the source of all of her creativity, that experience of being a child listening to the ocean in St. Ives. She wrote a trilogy of novels that trying to capture um, those experiences. And the novel that I'm particularly obsessed with is The Waves <laughs> for obvious reasons. I feel like it is the, you know, in some ways the perfect embodiment <laughs> of the oceanic because it's literally six characters that are friends and they have one consciousness and their consciousness bleeds into each other and it follows them across their lives through series of um, stream of consciousness soliloquies. But there's one character, um, Rhoda, who is kind of a little bit apart from the group and she's kind of an interesting character because in some ways she em embodies like Chris Deva's conception of the oceanic as you know melancholic and dreadful um but she is described as being faceless so she has kind of no solid sense of identity and ultimately she commits suicide possibly by jumping off a cliff into the ocean and so i've been thinking a lot about you know, and we also know that Virginia Woolf committed suicide. So there's a way, and Virginia Woolf's creative process was very much akin to what Marion Milner was describing, was just this process of going under and coming to the surface. Um, but so I was thinking about also, you know, kind of even the danger of trying to access the oceanic because you know, you, you can enter it and then, you know, you can, you know, exit it as a way of kind of maintaining your grounding of not being completely engulfed by it. But there's always the danger of going, you know, too far and not being able to come back. Um, and so even when I think about, you know, the... Um, what Milner describes as the creative process, I think about how it relates to the oscillation between dream and waking states. Um, Milner described the oscillation between um, oceanic consciousness or oceanic feeling and focus consciousness as being akin to the oscillation between being asleep and dreaming and being awake. In some ways, I wonder if like that oscillation is, you know, built into us as a kind of survival mechanism. So when we're asleep, you know, we dream. There's a way in which the detritus of our waking life is rearranged and processed in our dream life. But new things become possible through the kind of collapse of a linear progression of cause and effect so you know dream states are similar similar to oceanic states in that um, boundaries don't really apply um, there's often a confusion of identity as well in dreams um, but also maybe dream states can open up possibilities by you know, shutting off the kind of control sovereign part of the brain that wants to, you know, produce a very specific outcome and manage everything. Um, so I think of, you know, in some ways, dreaming being the place where people are radically unsovereign um, and it reveals the subject to be fractured and. Unwhole, in a sense. 
And alongside dream states, um, trauma is also a pivotal point in, in, in this work as another way of confronting the unstructured self and perhaps as a way of accessing the state of unbounded listeners. Could you talk about the importance of trauma in building um, a communal politics of affect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, when I talk about communist affect, I was thinking about um, the interests of post-Marxists in Spinoza and what they found useful about Spinoza's philosophy. So Spinoza's kind of described as, you know, anti-Hegelian or the kind of pit against each other um, because, you know, Hegel's dialectic was a negative dialectic. There was a process of negation. So people who are more invested in vitalism, like Deleuze and Guattari are more interested in um, Spinoza than Hegel. Um, and part of what is enabling about Spinoza when viewed through a post-Marxist lens is that Spinoza's philosophy basically is about revealing the connectedness of all things and the kind of mistake of um, you know perceiving separation or false causes in the things around you and so for yeah for Spinoza that's kind of latent you know he basically argues that there's um, a substance that we are all a part of. And it's interesting because sometimes it's very hard to conceptualize of, you know, existence in that way because we experience our, ourselves as localized, as being, you know, we're like a particular point and our consciousness is filtered through that location. And like I said, I don't know exactly if that is uh, you know, an enlightenment construct that we inherited or even a function of the grammatical I, you know, like the speaking subject, or if it's psychological, if, our, if we perceive ourselves atomistically um, because we are psych psychically localized. Um, but what I, I really find Spinoza enabling in that it forces me to recalibrate. And I find it very useful to depersonalize um, things in that kind of way. And when I was thinking about maybe that effective state of experiencing the connectedness of all things being a foundation for a new kind of collectivity i was thinking you know like if we if somehow we could access that register of existence where you know we understand that everything that I do over here reverberates over there and that there's no actual separation between things and maybe some of, of our ego defenses that become a problem for politics could be worked through. Um, I don't know, it's like a very, it's hard to operationalize this, um, theory politically but in some ways i'm just thinking like what if uh, you know this experience of the oceanic could be a way for us to recalibrate and then reorient ourselves to others but like i said it's hard to operationalize because in some ways oceanic feeling is um you know related to trauma not necessarily voluntary i mean even in fred moton's conception of oceanic feeling relates it to the trauma of the middle passage, but he still sees that, um, you know, the 
unbounded self as politically enabling and enabling another kind of collectivity. So it's always, you know, in some sense paradoxical because um, you don't want to romanticize or glorify trauma or, you know, say that we should have more trauma so there's more oceanic feeling. But even on like a psychological level, um, you know, a lot of people have described as I said in the conclusion, oceanic feeling as a manic defense against pain. So when there's this feeling that something is unbearable, often there's like a kind of ecstatic ex experience that, or feeling that wells up as a way to block um, being overwhelmed by pain or trauma. I'm also interested in how Fred Moten borrows from quantum physics the concept of non-locality to speak about those experiences and changes of state that moves and affects bodies even when they're separated from by large distances. And I'm reminded of the famous conversation between Edouard Cuisson and Mantia Diawara aboard of the transatlantic liner that is documented in, in Diawara's film Cuisson, One World in Relation where um, the latter speaks of departure, um, and I quote, as the moment when one consents not to be a single being and attempts to be many beings at the same time. So my question then is, how can we reconcile the trauma of the middle passage and other traumas that relate to the differential experiences of life, also in the Baltics, with these experiments in collectivity? I know this is a very difficult question, <laughs> but is it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's funny because then it's like I don't want to incriminate myself here, but having certain experiences with your friends and going through certain things together, whether you know, it could be something um, like a very intense experience of collectivity, for example, you know. Uh, protest, rioting, something like that has a very intensely binding um, effect because it's an it's an ex it's a you know physical experience of collectivity. But even you know friends, I don't know. Like I'm I'm real, I'm interested in psychedelic consciousness and seeing you know how friends can deepen their bonds through psychedelic experience with each other is very interesting you know for me and thinking about how you know relationships themselves can be recalibrated through cert having certain threshold experiences with each other and in some ways um it's not you know something that uh, we should necessarily seek out. Uh, for example, you know, people who are soldiers in war together often have this like lifelong bond with the people they fought alongside to an, an extent that they feel like they can't be understood by anyone who didn't go through that experience. So certainly going through experiences with people can have an intensely binding effect. Sometimes we could call this um, what in psych psychological discourse would be called trauma bonding. And this is just, you know, something that mammals experience on a physiological level is when um, there is when people go through something that excites their nervous system to a certain degree they feel this intense bond um, with the other beings who went through that experience together and, but in some ways I think even just meditating on the connectedness to recalibrate. And as I wrote in um, 
the essay, um, even the everyday practices of care and um, making the constellation material also um, in some ways operationalizes the oceanic feeling. So people, um, you know, sharing their everyday lives with each other through cooking, eating together, having certain, you know, material experiences with each other, but also through dependency itself, I think that can deepen connections. Um, you know, it's very, when I think about all of my, um, you know, my leftist friends, my feminist comrades, and all of these communes and land projects that were started by friends of mine, they are, collective projects are extremely fraught. And I think that's because, you know, um, we're bringing all of our traumas to our interactions with each other and certain things that we experience could trigger certain things in um, ourselves in terms of our reaction to situations. So I think that thinking about trauma is a necessary part of collectivity and something that often gets neglected in favor of thinking about the surface of what's happening in communal spaces. So thinking about well, this drama is about this thing that it, you know, is happening in the moment and not about, you know, ev all of the experiences we're bringing to um, these experiments in collectivity. So I do think that in some ways, you know, I'm skeptical of psychoanalysis insofar as I think it does have an individualizing tendency, but I also think perhaps there's something that can be gleaned from psychoanalysis in thinking about modes of collectivity as well. Jackie, um, as I'm aware of time, I'd love for the opportunity to expand uh, this presentation towards your work as a poet too. Uh, how does the oceanic commingle with the experience of language and with the modalities of imagining within your poetry? I think for me, I'm thinking about Virginia Woolf's experience of, um, you know, the, the lapping of the waves. Um, for me, it's a, it's a rhythmic and musical experience. Like I, with my poetry, you know, I'm never really trying to precisely describe something. I'm more interested in um, the rhythmic dimension of creativity, creating a certain atmosphere or mood through accessing a certain pulse. And that is definitely connected to um, oceanic feeling. And I feel like I have to, you know, be able to inhabit a certain affective space in order to access um, I don't know, a poetic mode of thinking. I thought it was very interesting that, you know, when I was reading about um, Virginia Woolf, she would write sentences while walking, and certainly our capacity for rhythm is tied to walking. You know, our sense of timing is, is connected to you know, one foot stepping and then the other following so i thought that was really interesting that she would actually try to find the rhythm of the words through the process of walking so for me and it's interesting because i you know kristeva says and what's interesting about kristeva she actually has a very interesting analysis of poetic language where there's this kind of the pulse of the real that bubbles through in poetic language. And I, I think I very much 
agree with that. Like maybe I'm a little bit skeptical of um, this kind of Lacanian idea that the real is completely inaccessible because everything is mediated by the signifier, which is part of what I was trying to get at in my analysis and the psychoanalysis of um, oceanic feeling. Because I, I, I kind of don't, I think that it's true that, you know, we are ensconced in language, but I, I also think that there's this like rhythmic um, undercurrent that we can tap in even though we can tap into it even though we can't live there all the time. Um, so it's funny because I, as a poet, I often get asked about language and instead I want to talk about rhythm and musicality because for me that is what's driving the poetry. Dear Jackie, um, we've come to the closure of our, of our session and I would very much like to thank you for your talk and for our conversation today, for leading us in thinking about how the oceanic temporally dissolves boundaries of the self. Uh, and how the already existing communalism and the embeddedness in our experience of the world can be brought about. So thank you so much. Thank you for connecting with us today.